enough lip service from Powell. It doesn't really matter what he says because the numbers don't support and why he likes to get this market worked up and down so much, I'm not quite sure. But it's very clear that we have no real reason to lower rates at this point. Inflation is not conquered. The nominal change in most things are still extremely high. Even if we slow down inflation, the damage has been done. Welcome to the Next Level Income Show, where it's our goal to take your income, your investments, and your life to the next level. I'm your host, Chris Larson. If you haven't yet, get a copy of our book for free at our website, nextlevelincome.com. That's www.nextlevelincome.com. Just click on the book link and I'll even send you a copy if you put your address in. On today's show, we have Dennis Cisterna. Dennis is one of the most well-known executives in the real estate investing sector. He's the co-founder and chief investment officer of Sentinel Net Lease, where he guides the firm's investment strategy and growth. Relying on his keen sense of market dynamics, he's built a reputation for being a first mover in many market niches. Over his 25-year career, he's completed nearly $4 billion worth of real estate transactions across the U.S. and Europe. Definitely moving between commercial and residential investments. Dennis is also the founder of Guardian Residential, where he was at the forefront of the single family rental build to rent sector. Over his 20 year career, Dennis has held a wide variety of executive positions within the real estate investment and development sectors, including key roles at notable firms such as Kerberos Capital Management, Lennar, and Toll Brothers. A frequent speaker at economic and real estate conferences across the nation, Dennis has given his investment insights to tens of thousands of investors over the past several years. And today he's going to give them to you. Dennis, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. Appreciate you for uh, having me, Chris. Yeah, this is going to be a fun conversation. I always enjoy talking to people like yourself that have a wide variety of knowledge on different things. And you know, this is a really opportune time for this conversation, I feel, because there's a lot of investor anxiety out there right now. I just got back from a big conference out in Salt Lake here um, a few weeks ago. And you know, the question on everybody's mind is like, what what's going to happen this year? And some people are saying we're going into a you know a, a, um, a recession. Some people are saying, oh, everything's going to be fine. No one really seems to know. But you and I, I think, share a lot of similarities, kind of being counter cyclical in ways. Um, so I'd love to share a little bit about your background, Dennis, or have you share some background with the audience, and then uh, talk more about what uh, Sentinel is focused on today. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I actually started my career as a housing market analyst 25 years ago. So I think having that background in data and analytics and critical thinking has helped me throughout my career pretty substantially. Uh, worked my way up the corporate ladder, ultimately became CEO of of, uh, of another person's company, or excuse me, another operations company, and uh, realized that uh, I still really worked for other people, right? I had a board of directors, I had shareholders. At the end of the day, it just wasn't as satisfying as I thought it would be once I got to that mountaintop. So uh, in 2018, uh, I quit that, launched my own investment firm. Uh, another six months later, launched another investment firm with a different strategy. Six months after that, another investment firm did a strategy. And so the first two were focused on uh, the residential sector, which is is where more of my background lies. Yeah. Um, the the last one is on that lease, which is uh, is the current platform. I've actually sold uh, all of our residential investments, which include uh, build for rent communities. I was an early yeah. interest in that space, um, and so now we're we're focused on the commercial sector, and that's mainly office, industrial, and retail. Wow. So let's let's start with the residential because you have you have a lot of experience there. Um, and we were chatting before the show, talking about kind of where we are. You know, I wrote my book to and and focused on the value add strategy in the multifamily space, which you know we started on about ten years ago. And the demographics at that point, I feel like we're undeniable. You know, just the shortage. Um, build to rent has really been a shining star over the past several years. With that, tell us a little bit about why you moved into the build to rent sector and why you felt it was a good time to exit. Yeah, so I had spent the previous 10 years involved in the single asset, single family investment space. So mm -hmm. um, I was one of the first folks to lend, uh, do portfolio lending on single family homes uh, for a company called First Key. Um, and so- so tell, so tell the audience about that that may not be familiar with a portfolio um, yeah. loan. So you know, most of us are familiar with going out. Most listeners are familiar. I'm going to buy a house, whether it's for personal use or for investment use and get a, a loan on that home. So how is a portfolio loan different from that? Yeah. So these, these portfolio loans were basically 
solving a, a, a need that wasn't there for investors that were owning larger portfolios that were above the uh, FHA or HUD limits, depending on, on what kind of loan program you were in. Yeah. So if you were really starting to amass a larger portfolio, uh, but you weren't a hedge fund that had access to that type of, of capital, you didn't have anywhere to go. In fact, a lot of folks were financing it through either through recourse loans with the regional bank, if they were lucky, yeah. but a lot of them were financing it with hard money loans, which was phenomenal yeah. to me because loans aren't really built for long-term financing. So, um, uh, so we, we created these products that were generally five and 10 year loans ultimately ended up being 30 year loans that look a lot more like your traditional, um, primary residence mortgages, but they're all business purpose loans. Uh, and we would bundle those up and securitize them. So I was actually part of the very first securitization where we, we bundled about $250 million of those loans together. We created a bond, we put on Wall Street, uh, and it worked out for everybody because now we opened liquidity to the average investor that was building a rental portfolio that just didn't have access to that capital before. So now they could, they could buy more quickly. Their returns were enhanced. It was really a good one-two punch into that market. And I think that's when you started to see this was in 2012 when this really got rolling. So you really that's really, I think, helped fuel uh, uh, the, the investor market to a greater degree by having access yeah. to that capital. Yeah, without a doubt. And what, what's typically, um, you know, investors when they hit, what's the number like five to 10 properties before they hit those limits and the banks won't lend anymore? What's typically the number that you were seeing? Yeah, it was, well, some, it would just really depend on the, on the credit of, of the borrower number one. And then, yeah, if there was any kind of concentration limits, if it's going to be an agency loan, it was, you, you weren't going to see more than 10 properties, but that was a pretty onerous process to get through because oh, usually yeah. it was a one by one loan. Right. So, yeah. um, and, and when we started our product, we're like, okay, well, this is going to be great for anybody that needs anywhere from, from five to, you know, 500. Cause once you're above 500, you're, you're dealing directly with, larger lending institutions. But sure. as we went on, we we amended the, pr the product. So at, eventually we were able to do single asset loans as well, 30 year fixed rate mortgages. So mm. yeah. uh, it, I mean, it just shows you that how, how quick the capital markets evolve if they think there's a way to make a buck in something. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. So then you can do those single assets and roll those into the the, the product that you guys were ultimately selling, it sounds like. Right. So yeah, terrific. Um, when did you enter? You mentioned you were early on in the build to rent sector. Again, we've seen, um, we were just doing a, a portfolio review a couple of days ago and, you know, one of our build, build to rent properties, you know, we saw rent growth over the past year of, of over 11% in that specific property. Those, those consistently are outperforming apartments, it seems. Yeah. Well, uh, so I, I bought my first build to rent properties in 2017, um, which doesn't Great sound like that long ago, but in the grand, in the grand scheme yeah. of things, that was a lot has right? happened, right? Between yeah, then and now, yeah. You know, I, I was featured in Builder Magazine at that time, and it was like I was a fringe part of society by suggesting that <laughs> that um, you know uh, residential communities uh, should be purpose built from a single family perspective. Yeah. So um, grew that very quickly and. There's a ton of overall appeal to build to rent in general. Yeah. The where where it's lost its way a little bit, and and I think it still can perform better than multifamily because to your point, it's a lot stickier than multifamily. The average the average person in a single family home in general stays in their house for over three years. In an apartment, it's less than eighteen months. That so that, yeah. so that, that reduced turnover is good for single family homes in general. Now, when you factor in it's a newly built house, that average duration is estimated to be nearly five years. So when you're- Oh, wow. About, I didn't realize there was that difference there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, yeah. Because you don't, you don't have any of the maintenance issues that might have someone away. Even if you're a bad landlord in a new house, just less stuff goes wrong. And so that tenant yeah. is naturally stickier. Keep in mind that there, there's also, a quality of life factor in that, right? A new house is a generally equivalent to a class A apartment with more space. So your tenant is more likely to stay in there for a long period of time. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a real challenge. I mean, we're facing this now and I think this is going to flow nicely into you know, some of the latter parts of our conversation today. It's, it's more expensive than ever to own versus rent when it comes to, um, you know, those that are looking to buy, you know, the down payments higher, the payments are now higher with interest rates where they are. And it's really, you know, starting to shift the way, um, the way people are looking at this. I was looking at the Gen Z statistics and, you know, Gen Z is generally pessimistic when they're, when they're talking about, um, being able to own a home. And I'm sure that'll, that'll change as, as, uh, as we see certain things, what's your take on, on that and kind of where we are in the residential cycle. Yeah, so I think the macro fundamentals around housing are great because, to your point, we're, we're undersupplied, woefully so. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, yeah, millions, I hear of, millions say, of units. Yeah. yeah millions, millions, million, yeah. millions of units. It's a big deal, and it's not something that's going to be fixed anytime soon. Yeah. What I some some kind of pundits say is it's there's never been a better time to be a renter. I do not think that's true at all. I think there's never been a worse time to be a homeowner, and that's that's a, a fundamental <laughs> difference. So yeah. the benefit for you as a landlord is a home owner or a home like, so define, uh, sorry to uh, interrupt Dennis, but yeah. um, I, I think it's important to clarify. It's no worse time to be a home owner, a home buyer, or actually owning a home or owning a home that you rent out. Like what, what would you qualify as a home? Owner? Yeah, I would say, I would say trying to be an actual homeowner, right? Now, it, you're yeah. looking at one of the worst times in, in modern history, if not yeah. the worst. Yeah. Um, to, to buy, home, to get a loan, all those sorts of things. Yeah. Yeah. Be, yeah. Be, be, and from an affordability uh, perspective, Absolutely. obviously, you are at nearly an all time high, if not an all time high in most of the United States. And your cost of borrowing is now double to triple, depending on when you had your original mortgage. Yeah. Prices have not come down. And so the problem is you have the nominal change of that inflation that took hold. And it hasn't dropped down enough because there's not enough supply. Nobody's actually selling their house if they're locked into mortgages. So we've, you know, we've essentially created, you know, almost a a bastardized version of rent control in this country where we have mm. the people that have mortgages have absolutely no incentive to sell unless they're forced to. Yeah. And, and and that's that's just reduced the supply so much, which is kind of what happens in New York with rent control. These people that are in rent control department find a way to stay in those units no matter what. Even if their family outgrows the space, they move it on to the next generation, whatever. Um, and yeah. so the big problem for us. Now, being a, an investor in homes right now, it's great because that demand is there, but you also are under a high interest rate environment and elevated prices. So if you are buying a property today that is kind of move in ready, your cash on cash return is going to be pitiful. You're going to earn more money in your high yield savings account. Yeah, we just to your point, we just passed on a deal um, outside of Houston. We own an apartment complex there. Um, great, great area, you know, great suburb, um, but build a rent community. And you're looking at cash on cash of four to five percent on that best case scenario. Yeah. Right. And, and I think where a lot of folks on the residential sector side are are stuck is that you have a very hard time. I think you would have a very hard time convincing most institutional investors. How exactly are you getting to a certain IRR level? Because right. for that to for that to happen, you have to you have to have cap rate compression and you have to have rent growth. And while I agree with you, the markets that are still succeeding in rent growth. There are a lot of other ones that aren't, and you're starting to see certain markets where we've just reached a breaking point of what people can afford. Right. And so some of the conventional wisdom that I disagree with is, well, there's not enough housing, so people are just going to have to pay more. No, there is always a tipping point where they stop. And what yeah. happens at that point is that they actually start to make shifts in the way they live. So now they have roommates if they didn't have roommates before, or they live further away from yeah, where they, they move, need. Right. To live. Yep. Yeah. And so these things mean that that price, that price or rent growth potential being unlimited is it's just not true. You're just going to reach a That's breaking a good point. point yeah. in a certain market, and because of that, that means that you need to be very thoughtful about what your actual rent growth in an investment looks like over the next few especially as we're in this sure. elevated interest rate environment that may actually lead to job losses. So mm -hmm. factoring in the economy into that as well. And then the, la the last part of it is 
I think you need to really understand what type of cap rate you're going to sell this property at. Because even though you're buying this property at maybe a 5% cap rate and you're borrowing at 6 or 7 that is not the historical norm. Buying Correct. investment yeah. property with negative leverage does not happen on wide scale. Right. So what's more likely to happen is you're going to hold this thing for three or four years, interest rates come down, and you're going to be lucky if you sell it at the same cap rate. Because at some point, we have to go back to the equilibrium where debt is accretive to the deal. Because you shouldn't be taking equity level risks for a lower interest rate or a lower cap rate than what the debt is paying for 50 or 60 or 70% at risk. Absolutely. No, that's that's a fantastic point. Um, the, the deals that we're seeing make sense have some sort of um, uh, extenuating circumstance. Like the deal we did instead in Houston is a partnership where we're we're converting half the units to affordable housing. We're getting a tax abatement with that situation. So, you know, there to me, it's like, you know, like you said, just going out and buying a single family rental or, you know, a class B, class A apartment and just saying, oh, let's hope let's hope it goes up in value and we can grow rents 5% a year. It's going to be very challenging in the environment right. and, that we have. And, sure. and I think yeah. that's, a, that's a good point to kind of the operator you are, right? You, yeah. You're understanding that it is going to take a lot of work in this environment to generate the return because yeah. in single family before, you didn't have to do crap. You could have sat on <laughs> your hands for 10 years and made a fortune. Yep, you could have been absolutely. the worst landlord ever plan yeah. over ever and still make a 25% IRR. Those days are over for the single family space and the multifamily space. You have two problems, one high interest rate environment and all the other issues we're talking about, but you also have more competition than ever. You have you have more money chasing the multifamily mm -hmm. and single family space than at any other time. And because of that, you are dealing against sophisticated rational parties, also highly unsophisticated highly irrational parties that they don't know what they're doing. They're basing their entire investment strategy on a seminar they, they read on YouTube, or yeah. maybe they just need to park money to, to make sure the government doesn't get its hands on it. But it makes it very challenging to be an intelligent investor in that market. And I think as, as you're alluding to, deals can be done, but it's so much more work. You got to sift through just a lot of, oh, of nonsense so yeah. to the ones that make sense. Yeah. Yeah, four. Yeah, at least four times as many, if not more. Um, and one area, I'll, I'll one one other area before we shift. I want to I want to talk more about um, what you're seeing in the office space, um, the commercial space out there, because it's you know there's a lot of there's a lot of interesting things going on. Um, we also uh, we have 20 mobile home parks at this point, Dennis, and it's a little different than than multifamily. Um, we've seen some you know some. Um, great metrics in terms of affordability and those sorts of things that you just can't, you just can't find. Um, did you, your research, did you ever incorporate any of that into uh, the residential space? I know some people don't consider it part of like residential or multifamily, but I see it almost as a derivation of that. Yeah. I, I, I don't do any direct research into, into multifamily, but I certainly like some of the fundamentals around mobile it. Home, and I, mobile homes. Yeah. I, sorry. Mobile homes. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. And, uh, oh, it's all good. I, I think, I think, uh, you know, there's a reason that Blackstone and a lot of other PE firms got in that space because the margins are phenomenal. You are dealing with an affordable class and, um, you know, you have this ability to push rents pretty significantly in a lot of these places because they are um, undermanaged, underutilized communities, right? And I think the same thing you see in self-storage space when we're talking about yep. other kind of uh, niche opportunities where, there's a lot of people out there that own a lot of these communities, a lot of stealth storage facilities. They don't operate them to their full potential. And you have an ability to come in as a sophisticated investor and, and create a big lift very quickly if you know what you're doing. So yeah, I yeah. I, I like I like a lot of opportunities in that space, especially long term, because we know the macro headwinds um uh for for the supply is not good. Yeah. Yeah, great point. And and just to to reiterate something you just said uh, a minute or two ago. What we're seeing there is we have to go after deals, and this is really our core strategy, that have, have low occupancy, that have been owned by a mom and pop operator for years, and they just don't have the capital to take it from 50 or 60% occupancy to stabilize at 80 or 90%. So it's more work. It's a specialized strategy. Um, you know, you don't have a ton of competition in that space, especially if you're buying some of these smaller parks. Um, but it, it's certainly way different than buying you know, a brand new single family home 
And like you said, sticking somebody in there for a few years. Um, right. But the, the reason you're on today and kind of a selfish perspective, I'm really excited um, to talk about, talk to you about a commercial office. It's, uh, you know, we've seen a, a massive shift away from certain, you know, core business areas like San Francisco. We see vacancy rates going up and, you know, not a day goes by if you're following that there's not a story talking about the cracks in the CRE market. Um, can we start kind of at a high level, Dennis, and and talk about like why and when you all got into that space and then talk about um, where where you see it today and then ultimately your strategy? Are you ready to elevate your portfolio? Are you looking for a firm that knows how to create value and sees the potential of today's market instability? Let me introduce you to my friends at Sentinel Net Lease. These guys have a great background and are changing the game by bringing Wall Street caliber real estate deals to Main Street investors like yourself. They've just launched their latest fund where they are focused on stabilized office, retail, and industrial properties that generate outsized cash on cash returns from day one. If you're an accredited investor and would like to learn more, visit Sentinel opfund.com. That's sentinel, O-P-P-F-U-N-D.com and take the next steps towards passive investments with Sentinel. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So, so I, I've, I've worked in the commercial space throughout my career. Uh, I was in investment banking for about 10 years. So I raised a lot of debt and equity in that space for a number of operators um, back after the, after the session. Um, we started Sentinel in late 2019 Honestly, as a way to deploy some capital for my uh, my business partner's family trust, and as we were exploring the net lease space, which is really just just you know could be office, retail, or industrial, but it's really where the all of the operating costs go onto the the um, shoulders of the tenant, not the the landlord. You know, we were looking at like McDonald's and Starbucks and CVS, and and it was ugly. I didn't like the profile at all. That whole universe is kind of built for 1031 investors that don't really care about the actual returns or what they're mm -hmm. paying for. They just need to place their money somewhere um, to defer taxes. But, you know, seeing these these things where, you know, they're trading for a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars a square foot where the replacement cost is two fifty. I just didn't and 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 yeah. taking that big risk and buying at a huge premium to replacement cost you were getting a 10, 15, 20 year lease at a four or five percent cap rate. I just didn't see that yeah. as being a very sexy, sexy opportunity. Yeah. So we looked up a little bit more into the middle market. So we were looking now at assets between five and, and 25 million. And, mm -hmm. and it was the light bulb went off where I said, this is the space that used to be dominated by institutions. But as institutions got bigger and bigger and bigger, they have that space. And these assets are generally too big for the 1031 investors who are a little less disciplined. So it's a little bit of the wild, wild west when it comes to valuations. And because I started my career as, a, as, as an analyst in real estate, like I feel I'm pretty good at valuing real estate uh, and understanding the risk adjusted return. So, you know, I would look at a, at a, at a grocery store um, and the grocery store would trade at a very high cap rate. I'm, I don't, why is this? Well, it's, it's a privately held grocery store. You don't know the financials. Okay. I, I may not know the financials, but I know they have a hundred stores that have been open in the last 70 years. They're probably not going under in the next few years. And I'm sure I can get enough anecdotal information to kind of support how this company is up and, and, and if they're credit worthy. And then I would, uh, and then I would see another thing where it's a, you know, it's a, a call center and it's, it's T-Mobile. T-Mobile's got, you know, great credit. It's a mm -hmm. long-term lease and it's trading at a, you know, a seven and a half or an eight cap when I can borrow it at three. Why, why is that happening? And it's just a function of the brokers are the primary drivers of some of these valuations. Mm -hmm. They're not quite sure how to value them because they're in a market with more limited competition. And so you can kind of pick and choose opportunities in that space where I think the risk to return far exceeds what you can find for more commoditized product. And so we we built Sentinel. For, we closed on our first. It was an Amazon customer service center in Huntington, West Virginia, in March of 2020. That area, yeah. But the, 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 so let me tell you two things. Probably one of the only commercial real estate investors that actually closed the deal in the last two weeks of March, 2020, because the entire country was getting shut down. 
Yeah. I was lucky my, my title people could actually get to the office to, to, to record things. Uh, and what I knew about Huntington, West Virginia was uh, Marshall football and methamphetamines. That's the only thing I knew about that market. <laughs> I used to work right. I used to go to an account right down the road from there. I know that area fairly well. Actually, one of my partners is in uh, Canova, which is okay. uh, real close to there. He knows Huntington yeah. well. Yeah. So, so we bought an Amazon customer service yeah. during the pandemic, and you know we we, yeah. we, met, we met with the mayor. We got a very good, we're very hands on compared to to the traditional larger investor, where we are going and putting our hands on the asset. We're talking to the stakeholders in the community. So we met with the mayor, understood the whole backstory about how Amazon ended up in um, in Huntington much longer story than 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 your podcast needs but it but it, it is a cool story and um and ultimately we're like hey you know these guys are not going anywhere they are so important to the state of west virginia they're going to throw money at them hand over fist to make sure mm. they never leave mm. and they're yeah. already in a build suit building so okay we feel good about this and so yeah. so and, and we kind of just started building our portfolio off of that kind of mantra of finding what we thought were Outsized opportunities where where the risk profile was not nearly as great as what the pricing indicated, and so we grew the portfolio to about three hundred million dollars, um, uh, and then interest rates went up. We hit the pause button because before this we were generally buying stuff at a seven or an eight percent cap rate and borrowing at three and a half on long term fixed rate debt. Mm -hmm. Before you were interest, yeah. interest rates were, and that's kind of printing money, right? At that point, you're easy easily getting. Double digit cash on cash returns, generally from investment grade, which is 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 a nice um, a, a nice needle to be able to thread. And yeah. so when interest rates went up, we hit the pause button. We said let's reinvest. Sellers still had this ultra high valuation in mind. Obviously, in the commercial side of things, we don't really we it's it's a little bit more disciplined than the single family side. It's a lot more reliant on debt. And mm -hmm. so commercial risk investments dropped 80% within nine months in 2022. Yeah. And they been, basically- It's been incredible. Got to feel for the brokers. I, I have very depressing phone calls on a daily basis where I said, you know, the faster you educate your sellers, the faster we can get through this. But- uh, <laughs> like, I'm your friend, let me help you. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, so, um, so, so now, you know, we basically bought a handful of assets in 2022. 2023. Uh, and I, at the end of 2023, I finally saw a shift where the enough of the sellers to understand that rates were going to be higher for longer, like mm -hmm. enough lip service from Powell. It doesn't really matter what he says because the number of support and why he likes to get this market worked up and down so much. I'm not quite sure, but it's very clear that we have no real reason to lower at this point inflation is not conquered the nominal change in most things are still extremely high even if we slow down inflation the damage has been done you know the, the cost of milk the cost of eggs it's not the, coming back it's not negative low. right and i think people it's yeah it's like oh you hear the administration say oh inflation's lower than it was it's like it's prices are still going up and it's locked in right. at this point i don't think I don't think people i think people inherently appreciate that because they're like like you said like the milk's still four bucks like what are you right. what are you doing yeah right do i still need a pre-authorization just to fill up my gas tank for <laughs> credit card 100 bucks this morning 100 bucks that's right so there you go yeah uh, so, so so i think that's that's a big problem and then as we saw it starting to loose up at the end of last year we're like oh okay let's do something strategic here because if we can acquire assets at a higher cap rate in a lower basis with more lease duration, well, now we're kind of hitting it all across the board. And, you know, to put it pretty succinctly, most investment strategies right now in the residential sector have some level of cap rate compression, right? Because if there's not cap rate compression and you're only earning four or 5% cash on cash, yep. what are you doing with your money? So, Philosophy is pretty simple. We want to go buy these commercial assets at 9, 10, 11, 12% cap rates, borrow at six, create a double cash on cash return. And if the cap rate compression occurs, it, it occurs across all the asset bonus, classes, yeah. right? Yeah. So, yeah. so it's relatively speaking. Yeah. Right. 
If it doesn't happen, then I am earning a cash on cash return that is double or triple what my peers in other sectors are. And so that is kind of my effective hedge on this contrarian strategy. And so if I'm able to buy assets at a, I'll give you an example, we're buying two, two, um, two fitness centers, uh, uh, credit rated national brand. We're buying them at 9% cap rate with 10 years of lease term remaining. We're borrowing at six and a half percent. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that we are getting a total return of our capital from just lease income. And because I'm buying at a, what I think is a 25% discount from um, from even the current market and about a 35% discount from where the market's been historically, I feel like I've got equity in the deal on day one. Yeah, love that. How do you compare, um, you, you mentioned earlier looking at replacement costs. How does that factor into your calculus, Dennis? Yeah, so, I, you know, it, I am a, we are a basis buyer above everything else, right? So I, I, I think, replacement costs is extremely important in the world of commercial real estate because it's if you're able to do that especially at a significant level you are a you have a natural defensive barrier against new construction right if you're buying a, a nice building and so we generally focus on class a buildings so if i've got a brand new uh, fitness facility uh, or office building or whatever and i i'm into that for half of replacement cost I can lower my rent as much as I need, you know, a substantial portion, even if I need to, um, to, beat to the make sure that I'm going to win that new business. Right. Yeah. And if the competition actually breaks ground on something, I'm already priced below them yeah. as well to begin with. Yeah. So it's it's a nice way to to kind of play in that in sandbox. Yeah. And if the new construction does come around and they do get demand, guess what? Now they're setting the new high water mark. So I have more of a... Uh, a rationale Average. to increase yeah. my rent. Shit. I love that. So, so it's a, it's a nice, it's a nice little play there. Um, and I think from a worst scenario perspective, let's say your tenant leaves and you have a vacant building and you you can't lease it up. Maybe you have to sell to an owner operator. Owning yeah. a nice building at a fraction of replacement cost, companies are gravitating towards cost savings right now. Let's see, do mm -hmm. I go build a new facility for $450 a square foot? Or do I want to go move into this one where I could have essentially the same thing after renovations for $250? Yeah. And so no brainer. That, no brainer. It just Chris, it yeah. just happened. I it so I, I I have to tell you this story real quickly. So we owned a J. Oh, go ahead, man. I love it. Th this is probably one of the coolest stories you'll hear in the office space over the last two years. So right before interest rates went up closed on a JP Morgan um, call center. We bought it. Uh, it's almost 300,000 square feet, big institutional class A campus in Springfield, Missouri. Yep. If you haven't heard of Springfield, yeah. Missouri, I understand completely. Um, <laughs> well, kinda, to, there, home, there's there's rumors that that may be where the uh, Springfield from the Simpsons is yeah, located. It, it, but that's the rumor. Be. Yeah, It'd be. Um, so it was, uh, it's home to Missouri State University. It's a, a metro area of about half people. But we bought this building with almost eight years of lease term remaining at an eight cap, and we bought it at $92 a square foot. Uh, JP Morgan says, hey, we want to shrink the space a little bit. They had a contractual right to reduce. We're like, okay, yeah. no problem. We had already negotiated with the seller that if that happened, money comes out of escrow back to us. So it was kind of a mm. fine. We're, we take it out to market to lease. Um, there's a hospital right next door. He thought all along the hospital would be the likely tenant. Um, and the hospital says, um, hey, we actually just tied up 30 acres. We're going to build a new campus. But this would work a lot better if we just bought your building and renovated it to our needs because it's obviously right next door, too. Like, great. So let's let's make a deal. Sure enough, uh, they were able to pay us a very hefty profit. Um, I was able to a 1.9 equity multiple on the deal in 23 months love it love it didn't do that's anything a win. i didn't that's a I win for those bid. investors that aren't familiar that's a win double your money in two years love that yeah yeah, yeah. We're not right. we did any, you did do something though you bought it with the right strategy and and that's where it's important to have downside protection when it comes to these things um, and, and I love that. Yeah. I, and I also love starving out your competition. We do that with our car washes whenever we have a new car wash open up nearby and they're running, you know, a promo. We just run free car washes until they're done their promo. It's like, and then, 
<laughs> Why not? Why lose a customer when we can just give away free washes while they're doing it? You so, know, the right, yeah. the right, the right basis will uh, will allow yeah. you a lot of flexibility to succeed in yeah. a market. I love that, Dennis. Dennis, this has been this has been fun. Really enjoyed the conversation. I know our audience has gotten a lot out of it from all the different areas that we've touched. If if a listener wants to learn more about what you're doing at Sentinel, what's the best way to find out more about yourself, Sentinel, and what you guys are doing? Yeah, so we've just launched Sentinel Opportunity Fund One. It's a $100 million fund focused on these outsized returns in the office, retail, and industrial sector. Uh, they can visit sentinelopfund.com. Uh, and on there, you will be able to download our investment summary, get more information about opportunities in investing with us. Uh, or you can email us at investors at sentinelnetlease.com. Outstanding. We will go ahead and make sure we have these in the show notes for everybody that's listening that wants to check it out. Dennis, really appreciate you sharing all your uh, knowledge, experience, and what you have going on today with the audience. Thanks so much, Chris. Great conversation. Hey, Chris here again. I hope you found this episode valuable. Now I have one more thing to give to you. We have a page for my coaching clients where you can get a free copy of my book, as well as much more from previous guests on the show. Just check out nextlevelincome.com slash coaching to get a free copy of my book, audiobook, and much more. I'll send you a copy of my book and cover all the shipping costs as a thank you for listening to the podcast. Also, please like, share, and take just 90 seconds to give us a rating on Apple Podcasts.